was um, I'll kind of we'll do a bit of a historical perspective because it's always interesting to work out where people have come from um, to get to the point that they are now. And then so we'll sort of I'll, I'll kind of leave that a bit. But if I'm saying something and you want to interject in the first bit, then that's absolutely fine anyway. Um, and it is honestly, he's a really funny guy. He's a really cool guy. So don't don't feel like you can't put in or whatever. Um, and uh, then we'll open it out. And I really want you. I know there's a few people here who are particularly interested in the subject. We are filming it, so do make sure you ask him lots of questions because um, he's got an interesting perspective on it all. Um, he comes from a similar background to you guys. You'll discuss that as we talk. Um, and he's been in the gaming industry from that kind of evolution, the sort of nearly near the beginning, not quite the 8-bit here, but certainly you know the the, um, um, the uh, sort of legendary retro gaming consoles and, and Donkey Kong kind of era, just right into the sort of present day stuff. So um, yeah, so that's what we'll do. Uh, we are at the mercy of Skype, so if this goes horribly wrong, I can only apologise in advance. Uh, but last time it worked. But this one is, is in America, so therefore um, it might all go piss up in America. So don't, don't shout at me. No, he's not American, no, no he's from uh, he's Scottish, actually, but he's from uh, New York. So he's meant to fly to the um, So I think we're going to be <laughs> so Give him a raise. Yeah. 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 Okay, one of them. Yeah. very tragic. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, I did these things at school, played bits and pieces. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, yeah okay. Uh, and then I kind of, you know, played trumpet really well, pretty well. I ended up going to the Royal Northern College of Music to do a music degree in 1980. Uh, did that for four years. 
and then I quit that and ended up playing lots of bands, uh, playing with Germanist bands and uh, other bits and pieces over the years. Um, and it was basically on and off the dole for probably, I don't know, 11 years probably, between 22 and 33. And then Little Angels split and that was my uh, last event, my last band thing that I did. And um, I spent about a year um, learning Cubase like, on an Atari ST. Um, and then um, sent sort of a cassette demo tapes off to a company called Rare in the UK that was a games company. Uh, and uh, after a year, they never replied. And I got a, I got a letter saying, please come and interview and I got the job. So I started at Rare in 1995. Uh, and my first game was a game called Goldeneye on the N64, which like sold 10 million copies, which is completely bizarre. Uh, and then I ended up writing music for um, like the Banjo Kazooie games, Donkey Kong, Perfect Dark, uh, Grab by the Ghoulies, uh, Beer and Pinata. In 2008, I decided to leave Rare and I came to the US to be the audio director here at um, Big Huge Games. And I've just finished a game called Kingdoms of Amalur Reckoning, which is out in February, and it's sold about 1.3 million to date so far. And that's where we are. So, um, there's a bit of a delay here, but if I take you back then, so just in terms of your musical grounding, when you were with me playing um, in the Angels, Grant was the trumpet player in the Angels, by the way, but he also plays guitar. And as you can hear, he's got a similar background to you guys. He was actually studying music, you know, um, as well as the Royal Northern College Music, whatever it's called. And um, the point is, you didn't have any of those technical skills, did you? Uh, no, I didn't. No, I had to, I had to learn uh, Cubase and all that stuff, you know, by myself. Uh, I know I'd never touched a computer in my life before, so it was all a bit alien. I'd played lots of games, but I'd never, ever touched a computer. So um, I'd seen, you know, I've been in studios and seen people use Cubase and things like that, but I never touched it myself. I had to, I had to learn it myself. And so what, what, how, how did you get the job, do you think? Quite rare. Yeah. Um, well, I think, you know, back then it was quite early days in video games, so they were looking for people to do, you know, music and sound design. So, I do, you know, so I do write, I do make sound effects as well as do music. Um, and I think it was just, you know, it was very early days, so I had a set of set tapes of me, you know, doing little, you know, two minute ditties of, you know, in a fighting game style or a platform game style or something like that. and. Um, just felt lucky getting the job really. I mean, I knew, I knew one of the guys that worked already, Robin Beanland. I played in bands with him in North Yorkshire for quite a while, so I knew him quite well. And he got a job there about a year and a half before I did. And he was even suggested that I try to do it as well. When Angels split and all the kind of covers bands that I played for started to fall to pieces, I was kind of on the door with no money and I, I, I thought my life was over really. What, what uh, so, um, what he suggested band? that I try doing what he did. Grant, so what covers it. band were you playing in? I played in um, Zoom the Roots, which was like a, a kind of soul funk band on trumpet. And I played in a couple of kind of rocky covers bands over the years to make money, as well as being on the dole. So I did that for probably, well, in between Little Angels tours and stuff, I used to do that as well. So yeah. I just scraped around to try and make a living. Is this Roger Scorpio and the Children of Love you're referring to? That was right, yes. I was in a 70s uh, glam covers band. Uh, we used to wear our mother's blouses. Yeah. And spandex trousers and uh, play 70s songs. Yeah, <laughs> I get that in there. I actually, I'm, I'm resisting putting a picture of you with this long hair, actually. Um, <laughs> um, okay. Oh, thank um, you very much. Yeah, no, I haven't done that, but we will do that later. Now, I've got, <laughs> I've, I've got, Grant, I've got, a separate, thank you. I've got a separate computer here, right, and very organised, which has got your website on it. So we could play, like, right. the, the, like music clips as well. Okay. Is, you know, like, you know when you first started at Rare, is there any, should we play a bit of, Golden Eye or something like that, and talk about how that differs to what you're doing today. Yeah, it can if you like. Is that alright? Yeah. It, it kind of takes a little bit of time. Yeah, I mean, I suppose, uh, you know. Or do you want to play a bit of another track? Which one would you want to play? To represent that rare early days sort of thing. I don't mind. I mean, you know, I, I suppose, you know. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I don't mind. I suppose, you know, back then it was different because, you, you know, we had to, it was all very much memory limited. You had to get make sounds very small, you had to take any samples that you found on, I used to use a Roland 1080 synthesizer and a, and a Protus FX, you sample the sounds from there and try and loop them very, very small and reduce the sample rate down to like 16 kilohertz, something like that, yeah. usually no longer, no lower than that, uh, just to try and get it fit in the machine because you had such a tiny amount of memory to try and fit, I think we had one megabit for all the sound, that includes music and sound effects, 
uh, in GoldenEye, so it was completely tiny. The whole cartridge was like 8 megabit, which is yeah. a tiny amount of memory. And what do you think of the... Um, oh, cheers. What do you think of the sort of retro gaming scene now? Because there's a lot of people who really love that sound now, isn't there? Have you got any opinions on yeah, that? Yeah, no, no, I think it's very good. I mean, I've got a friend of mine called Dar Danny Baranowski who... <laughs> He wrote the soundtrack to Super Meat Boy and um, uh, the band New Isaac. And he's a very big advocate of that kind of cheap tune thing. Uh, and I think it's great. I mean, you know, I think that you know, it's amazing to me really, that people are now trying to search out the sounds that I used in 1995. You know, I think it's it's a bizarre really. That, you know, some of the some of the sound effects used in Golden I've had emails from people begging me for the sounds. You know, because I want yeah. this really old, antiquated sound that sounds dreadful, really. But you know, I think it's great. I think I think even in even in pop music, you can hear. You know, all the kind of what the bass synthy noises sound very like really old retro, even like Game Boy stuff, you know. So, yeah, um, it's 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 yeah, I think it sounds great. I really do. Okay, right. So, I've got Goldeneye up here. Which track I've got like Archive, Bonka, Cradle, Frigate. Which uh, I think uh, you could try Bunker, I think, probably. Bunker, right, okay. Yeah, bunk it up. Okay, <laughs> So they were they were using four quality samples, so they sound quite you know decent. The actual in-game sound was not quite as good as that. <laughs> so oh, that's right. Funny. So that's good. Uh, yeah. So yeah. So uh, what happened was um, Monty Norman, who obviously wrote the Bond theme, is very protective of that theme, and normally doesn't let people have it without suing them, you know, dreadfully. Um, but we were given the rights to use it, um, so I just used it everywhere. Really, I just it's great to be able to use that motif that everyone knows. Um, and I later found out that he actually got fifty cents royalty on every cartridge and we, we sold 10 million cartridges so I think it did quite well out of that one um, much more than I got uh, no yes so we, we had the right to use the tune yeah. yeah Grant you didn't do bad though did you off that game mm -hmm. my memory serves me I did alright actually I did, I did from the first yeah I mean I guess that was the first I had done one Game Boy game before that um, and that was a lot different to that that was all in hex there was no mini file stuff with that so Golden Hour was my first kind of proper you know game and it, well, I must, I've got to say it was it was in a dreadful state right up to the end of the game. Everyone thought it was going to be a complete disaster. In fact, Nintendo stopped funding us for it for three months, but the guys in the management didn't tell us that. And bizarrely enough, it went on to send all those copies, which was, uh, you know, very peculiar. Um, and I mean, uh, funny enough, I just, there's a list that's just been published this morning of the all-time top ten shooter games. I think GoldenEye's number two and Perfect Dark's number three, so I think I could, it's quite lucky there, I think. Yeah. <laughs> um, yes, bizarre. So, mm. so, um... So that was like a very early game for you at Rare. How big a company was Rare, by the way? How many people? Uh, then was probably in the 80 or 90 people, I think, somewhere around there. Right. Okay. And, and how, did, how do you work when you're working for a company like that? Are you in teams, or how does it work? Yeah, uh, Rare was very particular about that. Um, it was an old manor farmhouse in Twycross that they converted into, um, it was a main building and lots of stables that they converted into game dev development blocks. And every, every team was kept separate. You had a coded key. They could only get you into certain blocks. They like to keep the team separate and be a bit secretive, so everyone tried to outdo everybody else. Oh, wow. We had a strange culture, but yeah, it's a bit strange, but it really worked. So a lot of the time, you wouldn't know what somebody else was working on until you saw it near the end. It was very, very like that. Yeah. I, the music people, um, yeah, the, the music people used to be in a, a block, but I was in because I, I was the last guy there. I was in this kind of this old converted chicken shack. It sounds a bit yeah, worse than it actually was. So I was kind of isolated from everybody else, um, and I was at Golden Hour was the first game I worked on. But yeah, obviously you interact with the team, you've got like, in those days the teams were like probably 15 people, you know, programmers, artists, you know, um, some designers, 
uh, and um, some music guys or your sound effect guys like myself. So um, you interact, you see the levels, you, you get design docs about what was planned for the level, all that kind of stuff. So you take a look. It's about you know it's about using imagination, isn't it? So someone says to you, I've got a desert level. You go from that desert tune, don't you? I've got a, fo a forest level. You go from that forest tune, it's a bit like that. It's about using your imagination. Yeah, um, and just I want to talk about that a bit about the, your approach to composition. But just before, should we just take through a couple of tunes? And so you mentioned Perfect Dark. Um, what was the kind of progression? Really? What would be the next one to show the kind of progression of things and from, from that rare period? What um, I've you? got to say, I wouldn't say it's much of a progression. I think, you know, because we were limited by memory, so you, you might swap the sounds out a little bit. Yeah. Um, so, uh, as I said, the Golden Eye tunes on the website actually are full quality, where the Perfect Dark ones are actually directly from the game, so you played any one of those. Yeah, and that's Apart from the credits tune. In fact, maybe. Should I play Perfect Dark? I think the credits tune is. It, not, yeah, but I think credits tune might be full quality, so it'd be probably best playing one of the other ones. Is that data dynamic extraction, is that one of them on there? Um, um, is it one of them? Uh, yeah, data dynamic extraction. I'll just get my website yeah. up I've got, I think, I think, yeah, that's, that's directly from the game, so yeah. Okay, that. so we'll hear this, so this is, so we're hearing this, is, let's see, what, one megabit, what you say? Bigger than that. So you have to always kind of shoot for the stars, if you like. So you you, do, you know you you monitor it all in the best monitors. You can't just like in any studio, really. But you know you do play it through TV and through a crap TV and a decent TV and a good TV and try and you know try and get a decent mix. Um, for but you know it's hard because you have to resample the sounds down from forty four to sixteen nearly all the time. So you lost lots and lots of top ends. So we used to try and add it back in again with editors and stuff like that. You know to try and make it, give it a bright sound. It was difficult. You know. Yeah. Um, but I mean, Perfect Dark was bigger again, I would say, probably two megabit for that, maybe. Maybe right. four, even, actually. And what, uh, so it's all Nintendo, what, what um, was it for? This was the, for the N64, all those the ones of it for the N64. Right. Nintendo, and, yeah. And um, the thing I was going to ask you, how, how many did Perfect Dark sell, by the way? Was that another big one? Yeah, I think it was like three million, something like that. Right. So, um, that was a very successful period at Rare, and I want to talk about the competition bit, but there's a few people who were doing dissertations on this whole thing about retro gaming, and they've got some really good questions for you, so I'm going to leave that to them, if that's all right. Okay. So let's just play another Rare one before we move on to what you're kind of doing now then. So what about the Banjo-Kazooie stuff? What would you like? Uh, Banjo oh, good old Banjo-Kazooie. Yeah, you, you could play something like... Uh, why do you play Free Easy Park? Everyone likes that one. Which, it's a that? jolly little tune. Is it on Christmas time. Nuts and bolts. Or you go to the. You can see it on the. Uh, no, but uh, sorry, it's below that. Nuts and bolts is for orchestra. The, yeah. one, the one that's on the, at the left at the bottom, next to Goldeneye. Ah, uh, probably yeah, I've got it. Yeah. To go in there, see Free Easy Park. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so it's kind of snow level. It's very jolly. Did anybody play banjo? Oh, when you were younger, by the way. Yeah. yeah. So these games that we're talking about. Oh, you see, there you go. Yeah, no, they're, they're all. They're, when were you born, you lot, ish, roughly? 91. Did you get that? 88. No. 91. That's terrible. It is. Jeez, that's terrible. It's really bad. <laughs> Hair's looking good, by the way. <laughs> Thank you, there. It's not bad, is it? It's still getting a bit left, you know? Well, oh, I'm playing three. Not like Bruce. Right? <laughs> yeah. Thank you. 
amazing to hear a full orchestra playing something that you've composed. Yes, it, and, you know, I, I think that's probably the most unbelievable experience ever. I think you just completely shit yourself, you know, and I did on very many occasions. Um, <laughs> I, went, I've probably done, I think I've done four orchestral scores, four orchestral scores now. Um, uh, yes, it's no, it's it's, it's incredible. But, but I think you know, you have to get used to it. You have to be able to walk in there and say, "Excuse me, cellos, bar four, you're too loud," you know. And even though I'm a Judas, I'm a Judas Priest fan, you have to get used to doing that. Yeah. <laughs> so okay, so but you know, going to the first one you did. I mean, are you so presumably are you scoring it out for every instrument and doing all that using Sibelius? How are you doing it? Right, well, what I do is I still use, I use Pro Tools. I used to always use Cubase, but I've changed the Pro Tools now. Since Pro Tools 8, because the MIDI on Pro Tools was always crap. Um, but the, the, it really is, just looks like Cubase now. So I, I just thought it just it made sense. I've been using Cubase, so Pro Tools a bit rare. When I came here, so it's completely Pro Tools. We'll just lost your audio again. I'm going to ring you back. Just hold that thought. Hold that thought. Okay, you got it. Okay, yeah. Cool, yeah. Carry on. Yes, so, yeah, so like, I use Pro Tools now, so what I do is I'll, I'll my Pro Tools stuff, it's, I use, you know, it, 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 it looks like an orchestral score, so I'll have it, I'll, it, all the instruments set up properly and all that kind of thing, and I'll, I'll tidy it all up. And usually I send, I send a, a MIDI file and an MP3 file to the orchestra to go. So he's the guy that physically, I mean, it, I think, you know, orchestrators can do as much or as little as you want. They can completely take bugger all that you've written and make it into big stuff. Or they can kind of, hopefully, what I provide is, I, 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 make, I make really accurate MIDI mock-ups of all the orchestral stuff that I do. So I use, like, the Vienna Symphonic Library, Hollywood Strings, you know, good, good sample library. So it sounds, you know, so all the stuff that goes into the game, it sounds pretty much like that, albeit not as good quality, but it sounds, you know, it sounds accurate, accurate. And then I send the MIDI file off and the MP3 file to the orchestrator. And he sometimes might change, he might say this chord bossing's a bit off, or maybe you're a bit soon to be doing that, and stuff like that, you know. But generally speaking, I think my stuff, because I played an orchestra as a kid, you know, playing trumpet from like 12 to 22, um, you know, I, knew, I know what orchestra sound like, I wasn't scared of it, I recognise the sound of it, it's nothing, it's, not, it's nothing new to me. So I think I can, I can do the orchestra bit quite well, which is, um, which is, it's just quite daunting. If you're not used to that orchestra, I think it's quite daunting, so but I didn't really find it that way. And, and where, which orchestra did you use? Where were you? Yeah, I've always gone to this orchestra, well, it's called the City of Prague Philharmonic. Um, it's basically, um, Prague's a really kind of classical music um, centre. It's got, like, I think it's got five orchestras, a big state opera, and a huge conservatory. Cause, cause conservatory. So I think that they're basically the, the kind of co contracting guy that I use will pick the best players from all the ensembles and make this kind of, it's a bit like LA where they put together all the best players to make one ensemble, it's like that. So it's, that's, it's called the City of Prague Philharmonic, but it's not a, it's just a, it doesn't kind of exist as a, a, a constant body, it's people that get yeah. brought in to make this orchestra. And were you, where physically are they recording it? Were you interested in how they physically record, you know, in terms of, is it a big SSL studio with a huge, you know, um, room, or how do they do it? It's, it's not as, it's not as, um, it's not like an LA scoring studio, that's for certain. It's because of Prague's an old, a very old place. It's, it's, this place called Barandov Studios. It's called Smeki Studios. And it's an old building that's been used for years. When they were a communist country, they recorded film there for years and years and years. It's a very old wooden room, and it sounds fantastic. You, you know, you always kind of s sort of seek out these kind of old places that sound amazing. But it's been there for years. It's an orchestra recording for donkey's years. It's got like a, a smallish control room. It's not that flash. It's got Pro Tools 8 in it. But they've got very good mics, very good preamps, all that kind of high quality stuff that you need, you know, so that's very important. Because, you know, mic an orchestra is a big task. And there's a thing called a Decca Tree, and if you've heard of that, it's supposed to be um, Decca Records, you know, back in the 50s and 40s, 50s when they were recording for orchestra. It's a bit like a tree, it goes like that. And there's mics that sit very high up in the air, in, just behind the conductor. But they also mic in every desk, so every desk can be mic singly in the orchestra, so you can, go, you can put it all together, you can take it. Pardon me, plenty of ambience from the from the nice room, yeah. and plenty of you know um, the, the mics. But but also, I mix it in the UK. This is a place called Pickle Studios in the UK. It's a very small place, but the guys in the orchestra mix it for years. 
so you still use, you know, tricks, a bit of compression, you know, you add a, a, prop, a really fantastic reverb, but that, that stuff still gets done in, in post-production. It's not just the sound of the room. Mm -hmm. The room gives it the kind of, it gives it that kind of, that, that quality where you get that, 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 um, that nice pre-delay, but the kind of, the big reverb will get put on later. Yeah, that, that's brilliant, that's really interesting. I am now going to open it up to the floor here um, and get into some fire questions at you. You're all right, aren't you, for a little bit longer? I mean, of course, yeah, 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 at least yeah. half an hour. Okay, right, so um, anybody, just say who you are and shout out your questions. So go for it. Go. Yes. Come on. Hurry up, don't be rude. <laughs> There's nobody, they hate me. No, they are. We've got Chris Bond over here who's got a question for you. I, yeah, sort of. I've got an area really, I hadn't actually thought about a question, okay. but you said that um, you got an email off a kid who was 10 and, uh, and he, um, you know, he knew all of the music and stuff. I'm writing a dissertation on, partly on exposure to music during childhood and how it can influence you as a musician. Um, I wouldn't mind asking you um, why you think these video game sounds and things, um, are put, or, or if you agree with the, the statement that they are influential um, to children and encourage them to turn into musicians. Sorry if that's not phrased very well. But. No, no, no. I, I've got to say, I do get other emails from kids who have said I played band music when I was eight years old and now I'm at university studying music. You know, that is the kind of... It's, it's so amazing and so incredible that, that you can be a, a small part of that person's life. It's, it's just... I can't put it into words really. It's absolutely incredible. Mm. Um, but I think that... I think, I think video games is, was looked upon as a kind of a a poor cousin to real music for a long time. I think it's now getting to be so mainstream and it's so intrinsic in people's lives that it just does make kids want to play stuff. Like, you know, there's a thing over here called Video Games, I'm watching now, there's a thing over here called Video Games Live, which is a, um, it's a guy called Tommy Talrico, who is a, he's a, he's a bit of a wanker actually, but he's, he's, a, he's all right. Um, <laughs> but he, 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 he just goes out and plays full orchestral gigs with an orchestra and just plays video games music and it's a it's a huge success. He sells out four or five thousand seater shows every night. You, you would not believe it's a it's a very large show and they just play video games tunes. And I mean, you know, the, the, for me, you get kids saying to the mum and dad, I want to go and see the symphony tonight. And they go and the parents are going, What? You want to go and see a symphony orchestra? So yeah, they're playing Mario and Zelda and all, you know, you know, when I was a kid, I didn't know anybody wanted, wanted to do that, <laughs> you know. No one wants to go and see a symphony orchestra play. You know, the fact that people are, the kids, because I think when kids are playing video games when, when they're like young, you go into your own little world, you sit there, and the tunes, they remember those tunes forever. I think the early days of music really stayed with you. Like, I remember the Beatles very strongly from my brother playing it and my father playing Frank Sinatra and the big band sound, which I still like now even. I think you get a real, that stuff kind of imprints on you very early and you never lose it. You make your tastes may change over the years, but you still have that kind of affection for that stuff when you're really young, because it's like your own little private time, your own little world, and I think that that really, I, I, you know, I don't think I really got that really until the last couple of years, just because I have on my own website and keep on mailing me, and you know, and I just answer the emails, and I started to realise that it is, it's, I think it's coming such a huge force, you know, um, it's, I don't know, it's incredible, and I, I, I looked, I'm looked upon as a veteran of the games industry, you know, which is really, it's, I just find it nuts that. I don't know. I, I, I really can't put it into words half the time. No, it's, it's a, um, but I think it, I really have realised that you know, kids of that age really do. It stays with them forever. Okay. Thank, that thank was you. Great. Um, lots of good stuff for your dissertation. There. Yeah, that's all going in there. That's thanks. All going in. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, but there's someone else doing a dissertation. Jake, are you here? Yeah. Do you, yeah, do you want to fire some stuff up front? Yeah. Um, what What was the most challenging video game you've done music for? Um. Do you know, I don't think any of them been that challenging. I just really like it. Um, I think, you know, I think the first game I did was Donkey Kong Country 2. I had to convert the SCNES tunes onto the Game Boy. And that was quite challenging because it just was, it was in hex. I don't know if you know what hex is, but it's just like a, you get a black screen of like DOS, looks like DOS, and you got, there's four numbers, and the first two numbers are the note, and the second two numbers are the duration. And you've got three channels, one note per channel, and a noise channel which can be the drum sounds and the effects at the same time. And that was challenging because it was, I just, it was completely alien to it. But, you know, I, I know I'm well known for being miserable most of the time, you know, tell you that, and I'm moaning an awful lot. Um, but, you know, it's, to get to make a living out around music is pretty, bloody really special. You know, and I have to 
I do find myself moaning about it a lot about trying to pinch myself. I mean, to get to go and make this orchestral stuff is incredible. It's like, you know, to get to go and do four orchestra, I mean, it's unbelievable. Um, so, I don't think anything, I, I suppose the challenge is for me is I really like, as I said before, I really like to try and write a melody. I really like to try and write something that's catchy, that people can remember, and it's, you know, just like, like a pop song or a hook. I think that I try to do that, and I may not get there, but that's what's in my mind. And the, the, I would say the overlying factor that I get from emails from people is always, we love the tunes, we love the melody, it's so catchy, I remember it now. And that's, you know, for whatever reason and how I did it, I don't know. But that's what I still, even with the top of you today, I still try to aspire to write tunes. Like, you know, um, this last game I've just done, this Reckoning game, um, I tried to write a really big cinematic movie-esque sounding piece of music. You know, it's a big, long, it's two and a half hours with the tunes. And <clears throat> I got... It's the first time I've had quite a lot of um, uh, the release, re the release of soundtrack on CD. I've got quite a lot of good reviews for kind of bonafide movie people who've never heard of me, never heard of games I've done, and I was completely new to them, and they really liked the tunes and all that. I kind of felt that was a real vindication of what I was trying to do. That I, I was trying to write a John Williams sounding score that was exciting, had lots of tunes, and people seemed to pick up on that. So. Is there so a tune I'm, you want to play again? We played that very sort of dynamic one. Is there one that's, that's very much, you know, like sort of maybe a sort of pastoral or, you know, yeah. piece? Or if you a go, yeah, if you go to the Plains of Erefel. Funnily enough, I thought, I thought it might be yeah. the Plains of Erefel. It says, yeah, that's if you want to play this, who is this Kurt Schilling guy? Is he, is he, is he like, like a baseball star or something? Yeah, I, I've got to say, that's another thing that's bizarre. Like, Kurt Schilling is, he's like David Beckham in fame in America. He's a, he's a, Absolutely, superhuman, massive sports baseball person. And is he your no, boss? He is, yeah. And I've never, I've never heard of him. And I remember thinking, you know, I don't even know who he was. Because like, everyone completely shit themselves when he walks in. But I was like, oh, who's this bloke, you know? Um, so, um, no, yeah, he's a superhuman sports personality. He's going to be a Hall of Fame person, which is a massive honour in the US. And he's like looked upon as this complete, you know, yeah, superhero. Um, yeah. But, but he's got an interest in, in wargaming, is that right? Yes, he kind of, when he was in his baseball career, he always liked to play uh, online games like EverQuest and World of Warcraft. So he's a huge online gamer. Um, <clears throat> and just when his baseball career ended, he, baseball players get paid unbelievable amounts of money, like 50, 60 million dollars a year. It's, it's gigantic. Um, so he, he played for like, I don't know, 20 years. He, he, I think he's, in his last year he got paid like 150 million dollars. Just, just his last year, never mind the rest of it. Was he the one who hit it or was he the one who threw it? He's a pitcher, so he chipped it. So he got $150 million for chucking a ball. That's right. <laughs> baseball, baseball is an American national sport. So okay. it's, even though it's very dull, and um, I remember when I came across to um, Big Huge Games my interview, um, it, it, Big Huge Games do a very long interview process. They interview for, right, with every hour you get two new people for the entire day. It's a really long, laborious process. Um, and they took me for lunch, because I'm British, I thought I'd take it for a curry, so I went for a curry for this, for the, for the, for the US guys, and sort of sat chatting away, and I said, you know, I said, it's funny with this, because in the UK, uh, baseball is called rounders, and it's, it's, it's just because they're like dirt. <laughs> <laughs> and like, you know, I think it's quite funny, and like, no one laughed, and everyone looked at me like, that's really funny. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that's the job gone, you know. Uh, no, right, I'm going to play your track. Smile. <laughs> it was like that. So yes, yeah, that's the question.
that's like um, that's one of the ambient pieces. So that's a big, obviously a huge grassland area, and I was trying to write something that's, that reflected how it looked. So that's my that's my kind of homage to kind of Williams and Elgar, that kind of very English sounding um, pastoral sort of thing. Yeah. Right, another question from the floor, please. Um, is there, do, you, do you listen to a lot of other video game music? Or is there any composers of other video game music that you are particularly influenced by? I've got to say no to that, I'm afraid. Um, I'm a bit crap like that. I don't, I'm really bad at listening to new, to new music. I'm really, I just don't do that very often. Um, I'm, I know I'm bad at it. I just, I'm usually at least five years behind the trend easily. Um, I just instantly, someone said to me, there's this great new band, I'll hate them instantly. <laughs> um, I just, I don't know, I've always been like that. Do you listen you know, to Judas Priest still? Um, I do listen to, I've got uh, uh, Satellite Radio over here, which is like that kind of pay radio thing, and it's like just dedicated, there's a hair metal channel, and there's a metal channel, so I kind of flip between hair metal and metal. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know um, what games you right, but what, you've been in America now for five years, six years? No, three and a half. Oh, okay, three and a half. What's, what's yeah. going on then, music-wise, in America? We probably shouldn't ask you, because you don't listen, you know, what, what's the difference between there? Well, it's still, I mean, R&B nonsense and all the rap stuff that I don't really <laughs> aspire to. <clears throat> I mean, you know, I think it's that very bland, I mean, you know, like that kind of sound that, you, I take it you get Glee over there, don't you? No. You haven't ever watched Glee? Yeah. No? Yes? Yeah. Well, it's a very kind of polished, uh, light, poppy, so that you get that kind of, complete split from like hardcore R&B, hip hop or whatever you want to call it, to that kind of really glossy pop that just sounds, it just sounds like Katy Perry exactly the same all the time. And I think America is genuinely very behind the, the Europe, so Europe's very cutting edge and changes very quickly. US just is a very slow monster, so you know, you still find people that still listen to Creedence Clearwater Revival, you know, like it was yesterday. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's, it's a, a big slow monster, so I think you get like classic rock will exist here forever and ever and ever, and it will never, never go away. It'll never, go, it'll never be out of fashion. It's always in the fashion. Um, so you know, I think it's a, like when you when I listen to things like Katy Perry, it just sounds to me like Eurodance from like 2000 or well, 1999. Even it's like the, the kind of offbeat bass and burp and burp and burp. You know, like that, that that that's so in the kind of pop sound now, and I think it sounds so dated compared to the UK and the Europe are doing that. At least ten years ago. Yeah. Um, what about you know, so? I, do you go out for gigs? Do you get out for gigs much? Or not really? Uh, well, I went to see Journey. <laughs> <laughs> I went to see uh, Foreigner. <laughs> uh, I'd say not really. Um, you know, like you do. I've got a couple of kids at like nine and uh, sorry. Uh, what was it? Uh, yes, nine and six. <laughs> so uh, get on. So I don't get out very much really. Um, you know. Um, I think I've kind of come full circle. Like, you know, I began life being very orchestrally orientated, and then got very metal and very rock, and now I'm really sort of back to the orchestral side of it. And I do enjoy the kind of popping music kind of thing. That sounds like a really, really old geek thing to say. I love your pop music, you know. Um, but like, um, you know, I, I do listen to. Well, you know what? Think, really thinking about it honestly, I listen to John Williams probably. That's probably about it at the moment. Right. When I was writing the score to Hamilton's last game. I listened to the first three Harry Potter soundtracks that John Williams did because after that he, did, he stopped doing them and they got crap. Um, I listened to the first three soundtracks um, just probably non-stop in the car for at least eight months. So I was trying to learn how to write his method of orchestration. He has a very elaborate and uh, sort of an ornamental woodwind style that he uses. It's kind of, you've got these flurries all over the place and I want to learn how to do that. So I just kind of um, sat and listened to it and, and worked it out. Um, so that's why the music in Amalore sounds like this. It's a very big, overblown Harry Potter, Lord of the Rings, epic kind of thing. But if you listen to like Viva Pinata, it's a very kind of pastoral, Borminsy kind of sound. Yeah. And the Banjo Kazooie is a very kind of uh, quirky, comedic sort of um, music. Um, so, you know, I do listen to rock music still. I listen, I, I think I just kind of, you know, I flick through the radio a lot. I, don't, I haven't bought very much very recently, but I would say. I, I think I, I really like Lady Gaga, I think she's fantastic. For me it's like to see, I'm, I'm sure Jim will testify to this, to see somebody like her who can get up and sit by the keyboard and play a tune and sing it and be good is like, I think it's so rare these days that people can actually get up and do it without the aid of everything else and everyone else playing it and they, but with, the, with no auto tune and all that shit that goes on with it all. I find that really fantastic and I think she's, for, for what, for what, how, however daft or mad she may be, 
she is a really good player and a really good singer and can write a good song with a good hook. Yeah. And I think that is like more important than anything. Very good. Right, more questions from the floor? Yes, got one at the back here. Um, with the uh, advancements in gaming, uh, like technologically, um, I think they're starting to mimic like films. Has that been demanding as like a bit like daunting as a composer? Um, I've got to say, I'm going to say no to that. Um, I think it might be for some people. <clears throat> I'm not saying I'm great or anything. I'm just saying that I, I just like that a lot. So I, you know, you do have to write cinematic sequences, which are just like little movies that, that exist in games. And the game that we've just done is because it's kind of a big role-playing, you know, role playing thing. You do get these cinematic sequences, and they're great fun to do. The good thing about that is that it's linear; it never changes. So you can write the same piece of music. You know, it, you know, the, you know, the guy's going to die at that point forever. The trouble with a game is that games are interactive and it, 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 that's why it's hard to write music for games sometimes because you can never rely on what's going to happen next. You could get a really bad player or a really brilliant player. So you write a massive, huge boss piece, uh, you know, like, like the, the tier that one we heard. And some of the players may never get there because it's, it's right at the end of the game it's really hard. Or you might, you might find that, you know, you write this really short piece uh, thinking that, you know, this is really easy and people finish it, it takes them forever to finish it. Like when I did Goldeneye, that's my first game that was big, really. I wrote, all the tunes are a minute long in that game, because I was told, but I didn't know what to do. The, the lead guy said, make it a minute, that'd be fine. So I did it a minute, didn't think any more about it. But like being in a lever in, in Goldeneye, you could be on there for like 20, 30, 40 minutes. So you heard the tune, you heard the tune 40 times, but <laughs> you're about to kill yourself because you can't take that piece of crap that I've written you. you know, so. so I think that games are hard like that. It's, it, people keep talking about making games more interactive. It, it's, when it was all midi-fied, back in the Banjo-Kazooie days, Banjo-Kazooie was a game where we stuck two midi-files together and we would allocate certain channels to certain areas in the game. So you'd walk into an area and when you went under the water, it would, all the ch channels would fade out and a, and a harp channel would fade. So you'd have these channels laid together like this and you could select the harp for the water and just a bassoon and the oboe for this bit. And you could do all that kind of switching but on the fly because it's all midi-files and all the samples are sat inside the machine. But now, of course, you've got real stereo, stereo streams. So you know, it's processor heavy to stream lots of audio from the disc at once. So you're try so it's hard to try and fight with the programmers and the artists to try and get your resources that you need to make that work. So on Amalor, this game is done isn't like that. But the one I'm doing now will be more interactive. You can you see you know in Pro Tools I'll write a basic ambient piece that will kind of go along that's a bit sparse, that won't get in the way that just kind of gives you a feel for the area. And then I may layer in some maybe arpeggiate strings and some drums. So when you get to a bit of a game that's a bit stressful, that bit will kick in and the big main will fade out. And it, they're all the same length on the same harmony and you switch between the bands. And then the next level above that might be a really elaborate version of the bass piece that's got lots of brass in it and drums and stuff. when you're fighting then it'll fade back down to the stressful level and then back down to the ambient level. So that's a challenge. It's, you know, it's, um, it's can be a bit laborious to do. Um, and sometimes I, I kind of veer from side to side because I think if you get really truly interactive music, sometimes you lose the melody because you have to write things that don't get in the way when it's on the ambient level. But, if you do, but on Amalo, I wrote maybe 12 pieces per region that were about a minute long. So you put the piece of play, it'd fade in, fade out, and go away. You'd, get, you'd wait a bit longer, you'd be on a timer, a random timer, and then the next piece would start a bit later just to kind of give you the feel for the area. So at least then you get to write real segments of real melody. So I think somewhere in the middle, somewhere, you know, you, you need to have your kind of melodic moments where it's special, and the ambient pieces when it isn't so special, that it gives you the feel for you in a swamp or in a, in a lava pit or whatever it may be. So, you, you know, I, but our cinematics director here kind of always says, you know, that remember that he, he can put the pieces together, the movies together, so it makes it one great, it tells a story, but the music is a bit that tells you how you're supposed to feel. And I think that's, People forget that in, in a lot of time audio gets forgotten for that. I mean, if you watch Terminator with no music and no sound effects, it's pretty shit. You know, so you have to. People, if people forget that, generally with audio, if people don't say it's crap, then it's you know it's all right. But they, they generally don't go, oh, it's fantastic. You don't all you, know, you get that with some people, but not a lot of the time. It's a kind of sometimes can be a bit of a thankless task. So, um, okay. Yes. Um, yeah. So no, any more questions from the floor? Yeah, we've got one. Um, one when you start composing, what do you do first? Like, do you just try and get a melody on a piano, or do you just try? And I think it varies. I mean, I think sometimes, um, you know, on uh, on the Amalor stuff, there's a thing called cities there. Do you see that? You want to think of the cities? Yeah. Can we play it? 
You can play one out there just quickly, just to send you a short piece. Mine's locked up now, but I think, yeah, it's just play, you know, half, 30 seconds of it. This is the thing, I, you know, obviously you're approaching a city, so I sat at the keyboard, I got a, a load of my French, I thought, you know, it could be a French horn, it felt, I felt like French horn to me, um, and just, um, you know, fiddling with the tune and put some chords to it that way, and sometimes it, it, when it's an ambient piece, probably chords come first. So. <laughs> same boat as any of you, except I've got maybe like better demos, you know, so like, I'm going to 
endeavour to contact, try and get all these, it's, all, it's, you know, it's not rocket science, you just really got to try and get all of the directors of these tiny movies or do student films like UC, UCLA and LA have got a very big film programme. Plenty of kids there right, and are doing little movies that need, need, need music and you, you do it for nothing. You know, that's, that's what you've got to do. That's good I mean, advice. Yeah, you've got to be proactive and be motivated. And, you know, and remember that all the tools that you've got sat there that you use, everybody else in the world has got the same tools that you've got. There's no difference. They've got the same things that you've got. No one's better or worse than anybody else. It's about what comes out of your head. So, like, I hope that the stuff that I've written in the past that people seem to like, that is just come out of my head, you know? And I, I didn't know it was any good. It may be crap, I don't know. But you just got to do your best of it. And you've got to remain motivated and think, I'm, I really want to do this. I'm just not going to give up. Right. And so that, is, that is the only advice I can give you. Uh, one final, uh, any final questions then for Grant? Anybody who's got a burning question before I ask you my last question? Is that all right? Yeah, Joe? Uh, okay, great. Do, do, you have a <laughs> do you have a play again that you composed for and you kind of later told? As a, as a player, as a player of the game, do you ever later told that maybe I should have done something different? Oh, yeah, all the time, all the time. I mean, it, the trouble is that, like, in years gone by, you could play through the whole game and you could completely know every single inch of it and you could get it, polish it up right. But the trouble with now is that the games are so gigantic and you're so pushed for time, you never get through it. Like in Kingdoms of Amalur, I got, I've never ever got past the first tutorial, which is probably 30 minutes into the game, and the game's been at least 100 hours. It's gigantic. This split fix in that game I've never seen. I've never ever seen the big boss fights, ever. I've never got there. You have to rely on, we have big testing departments that kind of just play the game over and over and over again, and they hopefully pick up spots. But the trouble with audio is, testers don't always pick up on bad audio. They don't, they don't, they don't even know it's, you know, that's the trouble with that. So, yeah, so I do play the games, I try to play them, but I've, I've got to say, the last time I competed on my own games, it's quite a long time ago. Um, it's very difficult to try and get through it now. But you always spot, because I'm the audio director, I, I'm, it's my job to have the, the American audio, I'm the audio vision holder, which is a very American phrase. Um, and uh, so I have to make sure that um, every sound in that game should, has to be how I wanted. So other sound guys I got to, that have here were very good. I have to kind of always check all the sounds because if the game comes out and gets really shit audio scores, then I'm the guy that gets fired and they keep the jobs. And that's the way it should be. I'm the guy with the title and the audio director. So that's the way it should be. So I have to make sure that all the noises they put in are, are up to scratch. But that you always miss stuff. There's, you always do. You know, and there's, you always miss bugs. And on a game this big, you're always going to find bugs. Are you allowed to tell us what you're working on? I suppose you're not, are you? Uh, not really, but I, w I don't think it would take too much to work out. I've just done a game called Kingdom of Amal Reckoning that sold 1.3 million copies. What would you do next? <laughs> <laughs> the Kingdom of Amal, it will be the Reckoning, will it? It will be the, um, what would it be? The Absolution. <laughs> is that it? That's it, isn't it? That's it. The Reckoning 2. <laughs> right, so, That's not what it's called, so am I going to see you next week? Well, am, I um, you? am I seeing you next week? You are indeed. I'm flying. Yeah, I fly over on the 30th. I'll, I'll be there on the uh, that Friday. Yeah, Friday. Me and Dave get the train down Friday morning. Right. So, um, yeah. So good. So thank you very much. Let's give him a round of applause. <laughs> No problem. You want, you want to do it again any time? Just let me know. It's no problem. Yeah, excellent. Yeah. So. Um... <laughs> 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 More than happy. <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> 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 Are you going to watch Sabbath? It's, it's not Sabbath. that, isn't it? Hey? That way. Oh, I don't know. Right. Okay. <laughs> no, I, I thought we're on the Sunday. Are they on the Sunday? Yeah. You're not staying for the Sunday. Yes. You are. Jolly good. Right, are you bringing the kids over? I don't think so. Why are you? Uh, <laughs> 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 yeah, right. Right. Eh? Right, okay. That's right. You don't want to expose them to that. I'm going to nap you guys. Right. The kids are coming over, but they don't go to the gig. All oh, right, okay. Jolly good. Right, um, so, yes. I don't so, expose them to your habits and your... Uh, <laughs> your <laughs> I thought you were very restrained, actually, Brent. I thought you were going to tap in all that. But you just kind of get it in, but I'm going to say goodbye now before you can say something embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, seriously, thank you very much. That's right. And we'll, I'll see you next week. Yes, you too. Bye. Yeah, one more time. Yeah. Bye. 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 There we go. Right. Um, cool. I hope you found that interesting. Um, I think there was, uh, we've got that video.
So I think um, there is some, you know, I don't need to reiterate, it's a really key point in all of that.